Good day, how are you lovely human being feeling at this moment? My name is Felicia Joy Clues and today I want to talk to you about Valentine's Day. Let's dive back into history and figure out where the holiday Valentine's Day came from and let's discover some interesting things. So Valentine's Day actually stems from a Roman celebration called Lupercalia. Lupercalia derives from the word lupa, lupine, or lupercal, which means wolf. So there's this myth where two twin brothers were abandoned by their parents inside a cave. Romulus and Remus were found inside a cave where they were suckling on the nipples of the she-wolf. Romulus and Remus are the founders of the city of Rome. So this myth actually caused for there to be a celebration and a tradition to celebrate on February 15th. So the Lupercalia festival started from people knowing this myth and back then there were two groups of priests. One group of the priests were following the ideas of Romulus and the other group of the priests were following the ideas of Remus. So these different groups of priests went to the cave where these two children were found to start off the festival. Feasting together and sacrifices were really common back in the day. With the Lupercalia there was also a feast and a sacrifice as a part of the tradition. These two groups of people would eat, would drink, would start to feel the alcohol, and after the meal they would sacrifice goats and a dog. The dog was not a common thing to sacrifice back then for the Romans, um, however they did that in order to um, represent the wolf in the myth. They also sacrificed goats because they believed that goats are very fertile animals, and this celebration, this festival, had all to do with that. So after the ritual of sacrificing an animal, then the group of priests on the site of Romulus and a group of priests on the site of Remus would have one young male who would then continue the ritual, which was to have a bloody knife used to kill the animals on their head, and that being wiped with goat's milk. And the milk was used as a sign of fertility because you know you need to have a baby in order to be able to produce milk as a species with a uterus. So after this knife on the forehead, wiping it off with milk kind of situation, the next part of this ritual happened, which was that the priests on both sides would get undressed, would use the goat skin that they used for the sacrifice, and they created whips out of that. So with these whips, with the sacrifice of the blood and with the milk, they believed that they were able to let the bad things be in the past and for them to create a more fertile future. So these priests would run into the city and they would whip women because they believed that that would help a woman's fertility, it would help a woman during pregnancy, they believed it to be less painful, and they also believed that being whipped by a naked priest with a goat uh, whip would give good luck. Something else I have to say is that the Romans also really appreciated agriculture, and when you think about the time before agriculture arose all over the world, there was more like a hunter-gatherer kind of community here and there, and men and women I feel like we're more equal. However, with the rise of agriculture, men who tend to have more muscle mass, who tend to therefore be stronger, were able to create more produce or crops or whatnot, which had a huge impact on the way women were viewed or view viewed. I have not seen any resources where it mentioned women whipping men with goat whips. The potential for reproduction and childbirth remained to be the center focus of this festival. The Lupercalia festival was also associated with other Roman gods. For example, the god Pan, who was associated with the wild and nature. Pan had really seducive talents. Pan was also associated with erotic aspects. He was really good at seducing others 
and he was trying to get really close to them. The Lupercalia festival was also associated with the goddess Juno. Juno is known as the queen of gods and she is known as the goddess of marriage and childbirth. The people that continued celebrating the Lupercalia festival after the original cave situation were also celebrating it. Wives, for example, were also being hit with a whip by their husbands because they believed that it would make them more fertile. The men who didn't have a wife could pick a card from a box where a name was written on. When that name was picked out, then that man and that woman would, you know, get really close. These women also sometimes were referred as pan women. Pan as the god Pan. The Lupercalia festival was pretty sexual, as you can probably tell. However, there are more stories to Valentine's Day and to the history of Valentine's Day. During the 3rd century of the Roman era, there was an emperor named Claudius II. Claudius II secured many military posts. He wanted his men to be focused on conquering land. And around that time, he felt that falling in love or getting married would distract the men so they would not fight as well for the Roman Empire. Claudius II then decided to ban marriage for these men. As the Romans were traveling all around the world, there were also Christians around the Romans. Where the Romans believe in many different gods, the Christians believe in only one god. There was a priest, a saint, called Valentine. He did not agree with Claudius II's idea to ban marriage. And because of that, he decided to secretly marry the soldiers to women to make love happen. When he was discovered, he was sentenced to jail and he was later executed. They found a letter which dated the 14th of February, which he signed with from your Valentine. And this is something that you can still hear today. As you can tell, the last story that I found on the internet about Valentine's Day is more about marriage and or love. I want to talk to you about what love is, so it's time to pick up a book. In the book, We Are Our Brain from Dick Swab, they're also talking about what love does to the brain. There are different stages in which the brain is a part of falling in love. First, falling in love. Second, sexual desire. Third, feeling the need to be close to someone for a longer time. During the early phases of falling in love, there is a social hormone, oxytocin, and this hormone oxytocin plays an important role. In the latest stadium of falling in love, which regards to the chemical reactions in your brain, is that you can get motherly or fatherly instincts. Falling in love seems to be something that just happens to you. It is pure biology, completely with euphoric feelings and all the bodily reactions like a beating heart, sweating, not being able to sleep, and having a emotional dependency to that person. In addition to a strong focused mind and obsessively thinking and wanting to own the, per the partner that you are interested in. In addition, you also usually have an increased amount of energy. Plato also thought about falling in love similarly. He saw that the sexual impulses that come from the fourth stage of falling in love with someone was located under the belly, he said. And he called this completely irrational thinking. During research, researchers discovered that when people look at pictures from their loved ones, there is a brain activity which is lower than the brainstem. When there is brain activity that is in the brainstem or lower than the brainstem, that means that it's the very basic thing of a human to do. For example, breathing and the automation of the breathing is also located in the brainstem. Falling in love is therefore also something, when you think about it, makes sense evolutionary-wise, that it's also lower in the brainstem. Because without reproduction, the species of humans couldn't have existed. By seeing an image of a loved one, there's actually dopamine being released. In addition, 
People who are in love also have an increasing stress hormone called cortisol. What also happens is that women tend to have higher testosterone levels and with men, the cortisol inside their brains tend to reduce the testosterone in their brain. When someone is in love for a longer amount of time, then the prefrontal cortex is activated, the front part of the brain. With prolonged love, it being able to be a part of your prefrontal lobe is really important because that helps with decision making to figure out if someone is a potential partner or not. With the activity in your prefrontal cortex, there's also less stress chemicals inside the brain. And there is a change in testosterone levels as well. So falling in love is a chemical response inside the brain. However, sexual orientation is something that is already being developed while someone is inside a womb. Or I should say, while a baby is inside a womb. Let's talk about that. Let's get this book again. On page 88 it says the following. Hormones and other chemical reactions are important for the development of our sexual orientation. Girls inside the womb who have higher testosterone levels are more prone to become bisexual or homosexual. The chance of homosexuality with boys increases when the mom has had more boys before the boy that is inside the womb at that moment. This is explained because of the response of the mom's body during pregnancy to the male hormones that the son is giving to the mom's body. When a pregnant woman experiences stress, it can also increase the homosexuality of children because the stress hormone cortisol has an impact on the mom and on the production of hormones that decide the sex of the child inside the womb. Although often people say that homosexuality is impacted by the surroundings, this is not proven by science at all. Children who grow up in families with, for example, two moms or two dads, doesn't mean that they also will become homosexual. So the just mentioned factors change the brain development of the child and especially the hypothalamus. And that is important for our sexual orientation. So there are many structural and functional brain differences that have a impact on the sexual orientation, which has already been decided inside the womb during the second half of pregnancy. So Valentine's Day, as we know it now, does not have to do much with <laughs> goat skin and whips and pulling cards out of boxes and throwing people to jail for marrying others. However, love is still something that is central around Valentine's Day. But then capitalism impacted how many people look at Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day currently has a huge amount of money that is coming into many companies' pockets because they are promoting or selling products that has to do with love. Many companies just want to make money around this time of year, so I feel like they kind of guilt trip you and want to inspire you to purchase things for the people that you love. Love to me is not about purchasing something for someone else. Love is actually showing someone on a daily basis that you care about them. Love is not about how much money you spend on another person. Love is also not about getting gifts for another person. Love should be more organic, more natural, and not so capitalistic, in my opinion. However, these companies are, you know, definitely making an impact on how people think. Many commercials show a certain way of what a perfect relationship should be. Often these commercials are not inclusive. Many of these companies forget to include there are different kinds of love. I have just talked about how your brain can react and fall in love with another person. However, love can also refer to the love that you have for yourself, the love that you have as a parent, the love that you have for your friends, for your family, the love that you feel for the people around you that you care about that are not categorized, categorized with the labels I just mentioned. Love is such a broad thing. There's a reason why people like talking about love. Love makes people feel good. I mean, there's literally chemical reactions inside the brain that make you feel really focused or really energetic or really good. And, you know, it makes sense that people like talking about it, like singing about it. And then it's beautiful. I'm not saying that you shouldn't celebrate love. I just don't think that you should celebrate love just once a year and half that day being, you know, crazy focused on by mm, companies and 
people that celebrate Valentine's Day and think they should purchase that one thing or they should go out on that one day and love shouldn't be filled with stress to keep up with the demands of society. Love should be celebrated every day, not just February 14th. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video that is lovely, leave a comment below of what your thoughts are of my conversation in this video. And if I can see you in another video, that would be lovely. Bye-bye.